NCR Silver Pro Restaurant, back office and point of sale. This version is for the USA and North America. For today's agenda, we're going to go over the USA contacts, your access points to get into the system, and any support contacts that we can provide to you for your NCR Silver Pro Restaurant program. We will then go into your training on how to show you how to We will then go into your training to show you how to set up NCR Silver in the back office. How you'll use the program on your point of sale and then what you're getting out of the system back in the back office. Let's go over your contacts. You should have already received your username and password to log in, and this is an example site that we're going to be working out of for today's session. Within the back office, you can see the various tabs, but in order to set up your system for your back of house training, we're going to concentrate on your user settings, the back office settings, the employees, the menu, customers, and we'll pop back to help. To start with your user tab settings, you'll need to click on your username. You then view that you have the ability to reset your password. You can log out, view account details, or purchase hardware. If we click My Account, this takes us right to an overview. With the overview, we're immediately given the access subscription number as well as other lines of information. Be advised your access subscription number is the most important number here as this is your, your um, account identifier number. When we talk about the number of devices that you can register to your back office, we need to look at the My Devices section. If you have more than one, and you want to have your devices intercommunicate, you'll need to set up a server. That conversation will happen with your uh, concierge representative, either on a follow-up call post this meeting, or during your one-on-one -on -one hardware setup installation settings. A server is not considered an additional device, but rather a tether point for your devices to intercommunicate. Your devices will be listed here. If you need to add on an additional, <coughs> pardon me, an additional device slot, <laughs> you'll need to click the plus sign. If you need to take away a device slot, you can remove it by hitting the deactivate button. We do integrate with paychecks, and if you have a payroll company or are in, in looking for one, feel free to let us know and we can share this information with you to speak with a paychecks representative. We can also look at your My Bills area. What you're being charged with from NCR will be found here in the My Bills area. All of your invoices are down below, and if you need to update your billing information and you're not associated with a reseller, there will be an update button located here. Moving on, let's talk about our general settings. Within general settings, you have your company information, store, taxes, payments, pay and out codes, charges, and kitchen routing. To start with your company and store information, the company information has various fields that are required to be filled in. This is indicated by an asterisk. You'll need to choose your localization, your primary company contact, pardon me, the business information, and at the very bottom you'll want to fill in your email marketing information. Be advised if an email address is not put into the from email field, no electronic messages will go out, and this includes your email receipts. Within company options, this is where you can choose to enable drawer checkout by a user role, or also print non-price modifiers on a guest check. These are very store-specific preferences, so I encourage you to uh, go over these during your one-on-one -on -one session with your concierge specialist. Moving on to store, just like on the previous page, if you have a required field, it is indicated by an asterisk. Here we have your primary store contact and your receipt information. The receipt information, receipt message, and tip message will all appear on printed checks for the customers. Whatever you fill in can be previewed here when you click the preview email receipt. Please uh, note that the logo listed here is only for electronic receipts. It will not appear on your printed receipt. Along with store configurations, we also have store options. 
Within store options, you can enable gratuity. You can subtract tip and gratuity totals from cash calculations in the financial shift, as well as enable different dine-in or order modes. Here the order modes are dine-in, takeout, delivery, catering, Apologies and drive through. If it's if, if it's required by a municipality, you can enforce breaks. You can also engage with online ordering. Now, with online ordering, you would need to have a third-party provider integrated into the system with an API key. Once you've established this, you can um, state uh, how many minutes until your delivery or your download orders are pushed through to the system prior to the expected pickup. So if it takes 30 minutes for takeout orders, the kitchen or the receipt shit will pop up 30 minutes prior. For a delivery order, maybe 60. For your guest count method, by default everything is counted by seat, so you can indicate by item and put the item value in each item that's listed, or by prompt by you indicating exactly how many people came to eat and your establishment. Your end of day time can also be adjusted now thanks to our latest release. So if you don't, um, if you want to have a changeover of your best end of day time, you can indicate that hour here. Be advised that a range is set on the local time, whereas when we cover another area, we're going to notice that it's set to the Eastern time zone only. But for now, let's move on to taxes. With taxes, by default, you're given one tax category. It will show no tax that will be listed at 0%. To add on additional tax categories, you need to click the Add a Tax Category button. You'll name it. Indicate yes if it's a default, meaning anytime you put in a new item, it will be applied first, though you can choose from your other categories listed. You can also choose to indicate if this is an inclusive tax. With inclusive tax, this means that the price that your customer pays or the price that your customer sees is the price that they will be paying. The tax itself is wrapped into the cost of the item. There is a special report that will show you what taxes are owed even though it's inclusive in the price. Once you've indicated this, you can change the percentage by clicking within the box and typing the percentage rate. If it's 6%, you're going to put 6, not .0006 because we've already pulled in the calculations for you. Another cool thing that you can do with our system, if you notice there's a little pencil icon to the left of the location name. Click on the pencil icon and then you can choose from one of two options of either stating that yes, this location has multiple jurisdictions, or yes, this location uses different taxes for some order modes. So you can have a different tax for drive through versus takeout versus delivery. Or you can say, hey, I want the breakdown of my taxes broken down by city, state, and county. Let's move on to our next area under settings, which is the payments. Within payments, if you're going to be running credit cards with the system, you'll want to submit what's called a VAR sheet to us. Now, if it's a regular traditional VAR sheet where you're only reading the max stripe credit cards, then you can expect a turnaround time between 40, 24 to 48 business hours. With the VAR sheet, before we can even have it in, it must be submitted to us by you or the processor. If you don't have a processor, let us know by request and we'll forward you a list of those we're familiar with. The VAR sheet should be emailed to both the customer care team and concierge at ncrsilver.com. We strongly encourage that your subject line be VAR sheet and be sure to include the active subscription number as this is the fastest way for us to locate your account. And once again, the timeline of 24 to 48 business hours is if this is for a traditional VAR sheet only. If it's an EMV VAR sheet, the process can take significantly longer, say 10 to 14 days, depending on um, the complexity of the VAR, as well as if you've pre-ordered your EMV chip card reader device. Once you have that information in the system, you will notice a change here in the integrated credit area of your payment methods section. You can then choose to allow for manual card entry, accept credit card tips, require purchases, require a signature for purchases greater than a certain amount, as well as indicate your batch settlement time. If it's set to manual, you have to manually push through 
the batch. If it's set to automatic, it will go at a time that you designate based on the Eastern time zone. For offline credit, offline credit allows you to continue to take credit card payments without being connected to your processor, internet, or even power provider for any given reason. You would put in maximum values in place, so therefore you're not risking too much while in offline mode, because while you can swipe the credit cards, you won't know if they've been approved or declined until you're back online again. Moving down below, if you're going to be using integrated gift cards, you'll need to submit a VAR sheet for that as well. And for the um, summation of your accepted payment methods, whatever is checked here will appear as a button on your point of sale. Finally, per one of our latest releases, we now have the ability for cash rounding. This allows you to round to the nearest nickel, dime, or quarter value based on the currency that you're handling. If you're running a credit card, though, it will still charge it to the nearest penny. Now, for paying in and out codes, this allows you to classify the actions of how your cash is moving in or out of your cash drawer. To add a pay in out code, you click Add Pay in Out Code. You'll type in the reason and the reason code description. You would then indicate how the cash is moving, either out of the drawer or into the drawer. Once complete, click Save Changes. When we go over your front of house training, we'll show you where the pay in and out codes are located. Moving on, let's talk about charges. With charges, this is where you can indicate special charges based on your needs. To go charges, a delivery charge, a deposit charge. All of it is listed here. Notice your charge can either be an amount or a percent. Let's use the dine-in charge, for example. Here, we see the charge has been named, and then there's a description. Yes, it is marked as active, and no, it is not associated with a house account. The charge is then indicated by an amount or a percent, and the limitations are shown here. You can even round to the closest value, so let's choose which taxes you'd like to apply on the charge. If no tax can be charged, make sure that you go back and put in a tax category and then try to recreate the charge again. We'll show you how to use charges on your front of house session next time. For now, we're going to move over to kitchen routing. Within kitchen routing, this allows you to group all of your order printers that will be functioning in your site. Order printers are most commonly used, say, kitchen or bar. I first suggest that you add all of the physical order printers here, and then we'll group them as needed. To start, you'll click Add a Kitchen Device. Really, it should say Add an Order Device, but the kitchen is the most common. You can then name your printer, so Order Printer. If it's a label printer, you can indicate this. You can consolidate your items on, one, on that chit, and you can also have it set to where it's one item per chit. Once you've made your selections, you can click Save Changes. Your device has been created, and notice that the ordering modes that are available will appear here. If you have already added on your takeout, delivery, or catering, those will also appear. So if an order is popped in for dine-in, dine -in, but they forget to pop it in the kitchen for drive through the order is not going to pull through. Now, once you've put in all of your devices, you can then group them together. You can do a one-to-one -one ratio. Say, for example, we have the order printer, uh, or all of the printers listed here, and we have a bar group. For this bar, we only want to use the bar one orders. Maybe you want to group bar one and bar two, so you can have both of them checked, meaning when an item is ordered to this particular group, that order will go to both bar one and bar two. Once again, it's a bit complicated, but it is very store specific. Be sure to cover this during a one-on-one -on -one session with your um, or your hardware session with your concierge specialist. Now that we know about kitchen routing and how to set up our general settings, let's talk about our um, menu. Within the menu, this can get a bit complicated. There are really three ways of inputting your menu into the system. 
The first, which we highly recommend, is for you to send your menu over to the concierge team. We're here for you when we want to put it in. We'll put all of our experience in your corner to make sure it's put in properly. If you wish to put it in yourself, you can do so by clicking the Import Items tool. Notice that you can click on the image to be provided a guide on limitations of what the import tool should pertain to. And if you click Download Template, you'll be provided with a blank template that you can fill in based on the guide information. If you don't want to use the template, there is an option to manually apply your items within the system. The first step in doing this is to first add a category. You'll name the category and then click Save. Departments, tags, and colorings can always be addressed later as they have their own subsection. Once the category has been created, you can add an item. To add an item, click Add Item. If it's a simple item, the only thing you need to do is just give the item a name, such as Orchata, and we'll give it a sales price. Notice no other fields are required in the system. Once you're done, we'll click Save. Now, if a more complicated item is needed, we click Add Item, we name it, and now you can go through the rest of the features. So maybe this needs to go to the printer group bar. Yes, it is active. Hey, maybe I want to add it to my favorites group. I can also put in a description. Modifiers can be attached to a particular item to enhance the item. Maybe you're selling an item that has an upcharge involved, like a side salad, and then you have an upcharge for additional dressing. Those upcharges or specific options or special instructions are all called modifiers. You can associate, you'll create them under their own little subtab called modifiers, but the group that's created is associated here to the item level. Notice we can tell we're working on the menu item level only right now and not the modifier item level. That will come a little bit later. And continuing on with the menu item level, we do have the ability to assign a tag, which we'll cover in a bit. We can also put in variations. So with this orchata, I'm, say I'm selling it by different sizes. We have a small, medium, and large. Once I've put in my variation options, I'll click Done. If you need to, you can put a barcode on the item level, or you can even assign barcodes based on the different variations. With the taxing and prices, you can use a single price and cost for all of the variations, or you can use a variation column header to indicate your pricing. So with me having different sizes, let's say my small was $1.50, my medium was $2.35, and the large was $4. Notice that there are some other features that you can choose. For example, Prompt for Price allows you to have a base price, but then it can be adjusted directly from the point of sale. At the bottom here, there is an also an option for price list, but these will all be filled in, like price list and tags, when you're running a promotion. We'll be covering promotions in just the next couple of minutes. Just know that you do not have to fill them in right now as they're not required. Now, once you put in the item name, remember that there's a whole modifier option here. So let's add in a modifier option. Maybe I want a modifier option, say, ice or extra ice. The printer group will stay the same. Instead of being a menu item, I'm going to go through the modifier item options. So while it cannot be looped together in a group, the item itself can go in its own modifier group. Now remember, the modifier groups are created under their own section. They're just listed here. If you don't see it listed, go back and name the group and then come back. And the rest of the options still apply. 
If there's an upcharge, you can put in the upcharge. If there's no upcharge, you leave it at zero. Notice that once you complete putting in the item, you can tell if it's a menu item or a modifier item. Menu items will appear as buttons, while modifier items will not appear at all. Other areas of improvement that you can change here in the back office. You can sort the order by moving items or categories up and down their corresponding list. You can download a full item list. You can also edit multiple items to affect particular categories by changing the category, changing the taxes, changing the printer group, changing the print priority, hiding it by marking it as inactive, indicating yes, these are menu items and modified by certain groups, or yes, these are modifiers and they belong in these certain groups. Coming back to modifiers, you'll notice that on some of the items, not only can you have it as a menu item, but you can also have it as a modifier. So yes, it will still appear as an item level, but it's grouped under a particular modifier group area. To create the modifier group, you need to click Add a Modifier Group. I'm going to call this one Drink. Notice that along with naming it, you can put in a minimum or a maximum value in place. Minimum, if it's more than zero, so if it's one or more, acts as a, a variation, essentially, because it is a mandated minimum that must be chosen. This is particularly popular with burger joints, where you have to know the cooking temperature for um, the burger, so that way it's cooked properly. Maximum values are when you don't want to exceed past a certain point. While cooking temperatures are great for a minimum, maybe you're selling an entree with a maximum choice option of two sides. You would then put in the two maximum. Once the maximum has been met, this modifier group is no longer usable on the POS. Just like we've been speaking about, this will be covered during your Fred House session to show you the example. We'll hit cancel. Oh, sorry. We'll hit save changes. And now that the group has been created, we can add the modifiers to it. There are two ways of putting in modifiers. If the modifier already exists, we can find it here within this little drop down where it's going to look for your item or your modifier item, or actually any items based on the uh, category and then item name. So I'm trying to find the ice that I put in earlier. Give me one moment. Here we go, extra ice. Because it already existed, I found it in the drop down. I can leave it at the default price or change the price automatically and click save and add another. Now, if the modifier doesn't is non existent in the categories and items area, you can add it here on the fly by clicking the plus icon, naming which group it belongs to. name the item itself, choose the tax, and then indicate your price. Once you click Save Changes, you click Save Changes again, and the item has been added to this particular group. Remember, the group is then taken back to the item and associated here under the Group section. Moving on, while your items are put into categories, your categories can be further grouped together into departments. To find the department area, you click on the More line and then hit Department. To create a department, you hit Add a Department. You'll name it and then choose which food I, or which categories you want associated with that department. So on this one, maybe I look at my food cat, uh, department. To edit it, I'll click on the pencil icon. Then I choose which other options will go into the food area. Notice whatever is checked will now occupy this category. You cannot have, uh, sorry, modify this department. You cannot have one category and more than one department at any given time.
Next, we're going to talk about our discounts and promotions. Discounts are manually applied discounts based on situational factors um, that can be either applied to the item or the ticket level. To add a discount, click Add a Discount. You'll name the discount and put in a description. You would then need to go through the options of, yes, do you want it to show on the activity summary chart? How would you like the discount to be presented, either as an amount, a percent, a prompted amount, prompted percent, or a set item price? The amount, percent, and set item price are indicated here and cannot be changed on the point of sale, while the prompted amount and prompted percent are flexible and can be changed directly from the point of sale. Once you've chosen your discount type, you can put in the discount and value. You can also indicate that an approval is needed by a manager for this discount to be used. Finally, with the qualification, it can either apply to the item or to the ticket level. And lastly, your minimum qualifying amount can be put in place, meaning the person will not get $20 off unless they spend $50 or more. Once, you've, once you're done, click Save Changes, and we can go move on to our promotions and price list. Now, while discounts are manually applied, promotions and price lists can be automatically applied based on a couple of factors. Before we can even put in the promotion itself, though, please note that we can uh, streamline the promotion by putting in an event. A common event in restaurants is called happy hour. So to create that happy hour promotion, you need to first click More, go into Events, and then click Add an Event Schedule. When you click Add an Event Schedule, you'll name it, put what days of the week it will be applicable for, the starting and end times, as well as the date range of when it will be active in the system. Once you have created your event schedule, you'll click Save. And then you can move on to the next phase, which is to choose your tags. So with the events, we're looking at when the item will be affected. Tags will show you what items will be affected by the promotion. To add in a tag, you click Add a Tag. You name the tag, and then you can associate full departments, full categories, items, or price variations into the system. To add the variation or any of the items, categories, or departments, you'll highlight it on the left side and then click Add to move it to the right. Now while we're adding these, after you're complete, you click Save. And we can move on to the Promotions area. Now, some promotions, or very common ones, would be like buy one, get one free, happy hours, maybe you're even having a combination. To add a promotion, you click Add a Promotion. You can then give the promotion a name. In this case, I'm going to do a combination example. And I'm going to have it activated by the event called Hot Dog. I then want it to be triggered to detect automatically during the event time. The buy rules need to be put in place then in order for this combination to go into effect. A good combination example would be maybe you buy a sandwich, chips, and a drink, and the drink would be considered free. We need to make sure we put in one quantity of each of the designated tags to make this combination. So we have our hot dog entree, say appetizer, and a drink. So when one of each of these items is purchased, the drink would then be discounted at 100% off. So in order to affect what will be discounted, we have to make sure it's present up above in the buy rules. Now while promotions are a great way to apply automatic discounts, price lists can be, get more specific. With price list, you, to, add, to start off, you would need to hit Add a Price List. 
and you would then be shown your price list settings. You would name the, pr the price list. You could choose how it would be affected, either by um, an event that you put in place or will be active at all times. You can also choose your start and end date. And then as opposed to affecting your items in mass based on your promotion parameters, you're going to manually key in the price differences. So say during this event, my coffee is actually a dollar. Not only can you go down, but you can also go up. Maybe my extra ice is going to be $1.50 during that time period. Whatever your flavor, no matter what, um, as soon as you're finished, just hit save. And the special uh, for this price list has been updated. Now that we know how to set up the menu, let's talk about the people who are actually selling your products, such as your employees. With your employees, your employee list will be shown here. If your employee, um, or actually, you, you should not start an employee record without setting up their user role. The user roles are the different jobs that you have on hand at your business. By default, you're going to be given two options, which will be store manager and cashier. To add more options, you can click add a user role. You'll name it. And you can even put in the standard rate of pay for that particular job. So maybe for this cashier, you like to pay them $7.25 an hour. And that's for the whole role. Now the exclude from labor reporting calculations, that's for staff such as your managers. Because if you're not really tracking your manager's pay, but rather your hourly employees, you would want them included. Once you've created the user role, you click Save Changes. After the user role has been created, you can add in permissions by filling in the checkboxes below. Notice that your point of sale access checkboxes will be up above and your back office access checkpoints will be down below at this point. It is important to, dis to have a distinct difference because when you're with your point of sale only, you'll be required to have a PIN code, while with a back office access, you'll be required to have a username and password to look at the information as we are viewing it now. Once you've created those user roles, we can then pop over to the employee side. To look at one of the employee examples, notice that we have the employee name. We have the short name. We also have the email address. The user roles are then indicated here by what's checked. If only the server was checked, then only the PIN code would be required at this point because the that user role was limited to the POS. But if this person has like an account manager or a store manager status, you can see that now the username and password are required. After, a user, after an employee record has been created, you do have the ability to change your PIN or reset your password. You also have the ability to click on the rate or the general rate for that role and change it for the individual employee. So maybe for this store manager, even though the base rate is $25 an hour, maybe this person got a raise to 27. This helps you to accurately define your labor reporting. Lastly, we're going to touch on our Customers tab. With the Customers tab, we have our email marketing, loyalty program, survey, customers, social, and house accounts. With your social, this allows you to put in the social media links for Facebook, Twitter, or, and or Instagram at the footers of all email messages that you send out from the system. The email messages are sent out through email marketing. With email marketing, you have two options, either the bulk email or the recurring email. With the bulk email, you'll need to first choose your customer base that will be receiving the content, the subject line, and then choose or and then fill in the body of the message or you can either swap out the image, put in some text, or even include a discounted offer. You can also hit preview to view the message as it would be sent to your customer. Notice, however, if I clear the offer where this box is now empty and then hit preview, 
the offer no longer appears whatsoever, nor do these little check tips uh, check ch uh, chips be here in the discount area. So, when you're satisfied that the message is ready to go, you can send a test email or put in the spam check. You can also send the message as is or share it as a Facebook post. The other option would be recurring email. With the recurring emails, these are set up by a particular trigger to the system. This is the receipt email. Its trigger is that your customer wants their email via receipt. This is also the area if you want to swap out the logo, you can click on the gear icon at the top right hand corner of the image area, then click edit image. So then swap out the image, put in a link if you'd prefer, and then click OK. The welcome and miss you emails must be turned on before the trigger is effective on sending them out from the system. With the welcome email, this email will go out when you collect the customer's information or their email address for the very first time. And the miss you email will be an email that will go out when you already have the customer's email on file, but they have not made a purchase within a certain number of days. Once that limitation is hit, this message will go out. With a loyalty program, you have one of two options, the first being points and the second one being punches. Points is based on the number of dollars spent, so one dollar spent equals one point earned, and punches is based on the number of visits. Once you choose which program type you'd like activated, you can choose the reward that the customer will receive once they're participating within this loyalty program. There will either be an amount or a percentage off. The reward will apply to the full ticket, so be sure to choose wisely. You can even put in a minimum purchase requirement amount, an expiration date to push them to spend it faster, as well as your own personal disclaimer on that um, particular loyalty program. Now, by the way, the only way for a customer to participate in the loyalty program is if you assign their name to the ticket on the point of sale, which of course we will definitely show you how to do this during your front of house session. With the survey, this is not going to actually be a survey for the customer to fill out, but a frequency or a survey message that you can provide to your customers based on a particular frequency. Because it's set to five, this little survey message shown here will go out once every Three, five tickets. For your customers, as you're collecting their information either from the point of sale or you're importing it directly here in the back office, your customer information will be stored under the customer sub tab. Notice that you get to see their name, phone number, and email right off the bat. You can also see if an email is in red that it is now marked as invalid. Odds are because we tried to reach them and there was no way to get through or we had a hard bounce back. If you want to add in a customer, you can click the Add a Customer option and put in their name as well as the rest of the information that you have on the customer. Notice that with your customer name, email, and phone number, your customer is searchable. If you write any notes on the customer, that will be present here. Any loyalty program use will be shown here. And of course, if they're associated with a house account. Now, house accounts are created under the house account sub tab, but you can see who's the owner and the max balance listed here. With house accounts, this allows you to allow credit to your clientele where they can either prepay into the system or have a base amount owed to you that they need to pay off. You can even, whenever you click it to the house account, you click Create Statement, and then you can see how much is due. Now, once again, house accounts are created to extend credit. So to create a house account, you must first have your customers in the system. You can then go over to the house account sub tab and click Add a house account. You'll name the house account 
and select the owner from your existing customer list here in the back office. Once you've created the owner, you can pull over their contact details. You can even add other customers who will be participating in the house account by clicking the Select Customers option. So to round out today's session, we're going to talk about the Help tab. With Help, this acts as your own personal Google into the back office. So if you wanted to learn more, say about your loyalty program, and then click Help, additional articles will be presented to you based on the topic that you are were, you were viewing in the back office. If you skip around to different areas, such as Menu, and then click Help while being in the item profile, the same will occur, where when you click Help, you'll now be given articles on how to set up and work with your categories, departments, and items in the back office. And not everything is clickable from the back office. Maybe you need to look up information on your printer. You can type in a keyword, such as printer, and maybe look up the information on what needs to be connected. For me, the most popular model we have here is the SRP350. This is our iPad screen. Please note that if you have more than one device on our system, and you need the two systems to communicate, you must have a Mac Mini installed as a server on site. That will be addressed with your concierge specialist during a one-on-one -on -one appointment and or your hardware appointment. However, once you successfully register the program, this is your login screen. If you remember from your back of house training, we showed you how to create your employee profiles with their own unique PIN. With the PIN code, you'll type in your PIN code and then hit login. We are now looking at the first level of our POS program. Since I mentioned that this is the first level, I want to preface this by saying there are actually three. There is the home screen level, which we're viewing now. There's the table tabs level, which is where you can view how many orders have been placed. And then there is the actual um, order mode in which you're typing in your orders for service. Before we even jump into the next level of the program, I want to show you what's on the home side. If you can see, there's a little cloud icon at the top right-hand corner of your screen. If that cloud is any color other than green, please be sure to click on it, and an explanation will be showing, shown to you why it's that color. If you need to also sync your information, meaning you have your iPads communicating through your server and or directly up to the cloud, then you can click the Sync Now button. The sync happens relatively quickly. And you can even tap to view details of why your host is online. We can also tell if our credit processor is connected or if it's online as well. On the other side of the screen, on the top left, we have our three lines icon, which brings out a slide out panel. We have your settings. You have the ability to adjust tips here. You can enter a quantity on hand. So if you sell a limited number of items and you want to set that quantity in beforehand, you can do so. You can look at the details of your system, who's logged in, are there any special events or price lists happening. You can also view shifts, what shifts are open, either open shifts or all shifts. You can also check to see if you have any pending credit transactions. For support purposes, if you ever need help, you can click help or you can click diagnostics in case you need to upload the diagnostics to your back office records. And talking about the other icons we have here, this little half circle icon with the arrow pointing towards the right is your log out button. Remember when you set up your PIN code, your PIN code is essentially your physical manifestation of you in front of your system. If you're not in the system or you're not in front of your station, you should log out to give room to the next person who needs to use it. Finally, we have a little warning icon. This icon will only appear if any um, printers are disconnected, you're having network issues, just something to bring it to your attention. Now these three main buttons that you see in the middle of the screen are clock in, scoreboard, and silverback office. Silverback office will take you back to the back office that we discovered 
during our back of house training. And we'll later touch on when we finish out our front of house training today. Scoreboard will show you an ongoing running total of your net sales through void if you have deemed that you need this feature. And clock in will start our shift. Now there are two shifts you need to start in order to get down to the table screen level. The first is your labor shift. This accounts for the hours that you work in the system. All employees must have a job code to their name in order to be able to begin the labor shift and gain access to the system. For today, I'm going to choose to be a store manager. After that, my screen has now expanded to show point of sale, phone drive through, or clock out. The clock out, of course, will end my labor shift, but if I want to begin my next shift, which is the financial shift, that accounts for any and all transactions taken with the system, I either need to choose point of sale or phone drive through For fun, we're going to start in phone drive through I will click that button and then hit yes to indicate that I am starting my new financial shift. If you remember during your back of house training session, under the settings and store information to store options, you have the ability to turn on different ordering modes. So you could turn on dine-in, takeout, delivery, catering, and drive through For today's example, I only have drive through and dine-in turned on. You can tell which area you're in whenever you click on the name. Within this panel of the order level, you still have your warning icon. You can still log out. You can hit the back arrow to go up to your home level, or you can click the three lines icon to view your slide out panel option details. The options are different on this level. For example, you can recall or reprint a receipt. To recall the receipt, you would click on a receipt, and if you see a recall button, you could continue typing in orders. Otherwise, if the order is completed, you can click reprint and then either print the receipt or email as needed. The no sale button will help you to open up your drawer on command. And your pay in out button helps you to account for cash flow to or for from your drawer. So with pay, um, remember we set up the pay in and out codes under your settings option and pay in and out area. So if you're putting in $50, you can type 50, will indicate it's a pay in, Tap the reason code. Maybe we'll choose change out, or if there's no reason code, we can put it in the back office and come back. And we can also put um, a comment. So you can say dollar bill. We'll hit accept, and we're done. Same thing happens if you want to do a payout. You hit the three lines icon, pay it out, choose payout, and then you state what the reason is. So say we do a happy deposit just for a payout miscellaneous. Now once again, in order to get to the next level, you have to start an order. If you start a drive through order, you would just type it in, and then you can exit out to save. You'll notice that whenever we type in these orders and we go back out to the queue, we now have an order occupied within the queue. If we hard press on the order, or sorry, if we click on the order, we can come in and finish it out to pay. Otherwise, if we don't need to continue the order or it's no longer valid, we can hit delete ticket to delete it altogether. Now for dine-in, we can either start the order in here or we can go back to our dine-in side, which is by clicking the point of sale button. Now there are really two um, main areas to look at. You either have tables or tabs. If we start in with tabs, this is where you can start a tab by clicking tab. You can choose to put the order number or change the name. So, okay, I'm going to tag this to say this is going out to Amber. Hit done and then I can continue on by putting in my order. If you don't type anything in, a tab will not be shown here on this screen. If you're using a floor plan or a table area, 
then you would need to concentrate in the table areas or floor plans that you create on your own. Now, unlike the other side, while we do have refund, recall, reprint, no sale, sorry, the recall, reprint, no sale, and pay in and out, we now, in addition on the dine-in side, have a refund mode because obviously you would want to issue a refund only if the customer is on site and in person. You can switch between tables or tabs by clicking the corresponding option at the very top, or we can create a floor plan by clicking Edit Floor Plan. To edit the floor plan, you need to first make sure that you have a room, if you're not going to change one that already exists. To click Add Room, we click Add Room, and we can name it. Let's call it Patio. You can then hit Load Image, and either from your device library that you upload your own images or from predefined images, that we already install in the program, for example, the floor. I put that in. You can stretch it. You can center it. You can make it normal. You can even have it on the side. We'll hit done. Beyond that, if we continue on the slide out panel while we're in edit floor plan mode, we can add in our tables by clicking add rectangular table or add circular table. We can also add objects. When you add the tables, obviously they pop over to the side. But when you add an object, it comes out as a little gray line. If you lightly tap on it, you'll notice that your arrows and circles are present. Same thing happens when it's on a table, no matter if it's a square or a circle. The rectangle or the triangles allow you to increase the width and height of the object. The circles allow you to rotate the object. It's completely dependent on your aesthetic. Now, the only difference between your tables and an object is that if you hard press on a table, you only have the option in settings to name the table and put in the number of seats present on that actual table. With your object, if you hard press it and then click settings, you can then either load the image from your device library, so you add in the images, or from your predefined images. With the predefined images, you could choose an object such as a tree, a different form, floor. So if you have like a dance floor area in the middle, you can set that up. You could even put in a bar. Once you hit done, you can take the object, rotate it where it needs to be, and lightly tap it here. Once again, this is all about aesthetics, and it's good to go through it during a hardware setup for a recap. If you ever need to change the room completely, you can hit settings. You can delete the room if you don't want it. And you can remember to save your changes by hitting the apply changes button. Once that's done, whenever you pinch the screen, you'll be able to see your full layout plan of not only your tabs, but also your table. And whenever you start putting an order in, if you just type in one item and you back out of the table, you'll see that the table is occupied by the color green. That's because it's my table. If I come in as a server and I, you know, and this is not my table, I'll see that table as blue. So the best way to think of it is green means go and blue is not for you. Another option you'll have once you've already created the floor plan is if you hard press on a table, and you're a manager, you can mark a table as inactive. So you can essentially block a server from using that table because it is now inactive. Another way of thinking about it is maybe you have the bar room one and bar room three or have the tables combined, but yet the check is all on table number one. Then we've isolated the fact that this is all together and somebody doesn't think there's an unoccupied table. So let's go back into order. Obviously, because this is the third level of the program where you're actually typing in your order. If we, all of the options are the same above, except when you click on the three lines icon, um, you'll notice that there is no um, no sale button because we have an order in place. But now you have an option to check gift card balances. You can also save the order or take ownership if it's somebody else's order and they had to leave suddenly. Remember when you were setting up your tables, you could indicate the number of seats. That number is shown right here. If you need to 
take away a seat, you'll hit the seat number or hard press on it, and then hit the delete button. If you need to add a seat, you click on the plus sign and it adds a seat for you automatically. This is beneficial, especially when you have a circumstance where there's multiple people at a table and they need to split checks. If you type in an object under one seat and need to move it between another, you can click the Move Item option in the middle top of the screen. You'll then see a gray line to the right of the name and you can drag it up or down. Whenever you're placing an order, the seat with the star or the for the table with the star shown will have the order drawn to that seat. Notice how every single time I hit a seat and I chose the item, it popped over into that area. So I can still move them from seat to seat if I need to. Now, Typing in a simple order is relatively easy. All you do is select the seat and you type in the order. If you have a complicated order with variations, like our pizza here, I click on my item name and I must choose between the variation of sizing in order to create that option. If there are modifiers involved and I click on the item name, the modifier should pop up automatically. Let's look at the turkey burger. Oh, apologies, let's not look at the turkey burger. Let's look at nuggets and fries. So under nuggets and fries, we have it's a kid's meal. We're going to choose a sauce, and we choose what size it will be. Once we're done, we'll hit done. If the modifiers are present, then when you click on it, the modifiers will appear. Otherwise, you'll be given your menu options. You can either increase the quantity, you can delete the line, you can provide a line discount. You can edit the variation. You could put in individual item notes. You can click on the group button to group items together, or you can move it to a different seat. Now under our favorites, we do have an option that will show you the modifiers. We'll put it under a new seat, seat five. That will be our grilled chicken where we have to choose with this grilled chicken entree if there's a soup or a salad. <laughs> Say we need to choose two sides to go with it. We want two sides of steamed vegetables. These are your modifiers. Notice, you can, in addition to this, you can say no mac and cheese, add regular fries, and all of these keep on adding up and up and up. You can also mark in your own special notes by clicking the add note button and putting in a note for this item in particular. Once you hit done, all of those modifiers will appear not only on your receipt, but also on the kitchen chip. So obviously your categories are down below and your items are up above. If you have the ability to add in your own items or categories based on your user role, you can click on the plus icon and name the category or within the category you hit the plus icon and you can put in your item on the fly. Notice the layout pretty much looks exactly the same as your back office. The only difference is you cannot put in modifiers here. You can only put in items. On the left side, as we were typing in items, we now see that we have the ability to send the order so we can preemptively send the order to the kitchen. Otherwise, if you hit the pay button, that order will go to the kitchen anyway. If you hit the ticket discount, that's for the full ticket discount, or once again, you can delete your ticket. For right now, I'm going to hit pay because I want to show you some options. For example, whenever you hit pay, all of your button options will be at the top right. You do have some quick cash amounts if you need to speed check out a customer with cash only. You also have the ability to hold a credit card as well as apply charges. If you're holding a credit card, you'll click the Hold Credit Card option, swipe it, or enter manually, and then that button that goes from Hold Credit Card to Use Save Credit Card. This is a great way to have an open tab for a customer without having them pull out their card again. Charges, once again, are special up charges um, or event charges that you put in place. We have Service. 
Yeah, service um, does not, it, you know, it applies to the table automatically. And depending on how you have it set up, you can either add it in or you can delete the line. At the very bottom, you see your split payment options. Either your ticket will be all in one or separated by seat. When you hit by seat, you can view all the seats individually or you have the ability to combine them by dragging the tickets and combining them together. Once you do that, you hit the little back arrow button. If you need to undo those changes, simply click the all-in-one option. If you need all the tickets individualized, you just hit by seats and then the back arrow button. And now we have five split checks. Going back to all-in-one, our last option is to break it down into equal amounts, where you can divide the check between two people, three people, nine people, 100 people. Let's do 10, and we hit done. Once you hit that, now you have 10 different checks. Now what happens if you have an order where they want to split the check, but they want to, say, split an appetizer? Well, we have to go back to our menu items in order to follow through with this example. Say the appetizers they wanted to split were the regular fries. that were topped with steamed veggies. Say you guys wanted five of them. Now, it would get very tedious to keep on typing in this item again and again and again. So as a quick trick for your benefit, I'm going to show you that if you click on the one inside of the square, you can increase the quantity to five and hit done. Going back to pay, we can go back and look at our split check options. We'll do it by seat. But notice whatever is in for the table needs to be split evenly amongst these five seats. When we hit our back arrow, we now are being told that the four table item splits will be split evenly amongst the other seats that were occupied. At that point, our checks are complete. Now we need to pay. When you pay, you select a ticket, hit one of your payment options, and then hit close once it's paid in full. Once the ticket is closed and no changes due, that ticket is completely finished. Say we decide to use a credit card. I'll pretend my house account is a credit card. If you have it set to sign up automatically, then you put it in place and we can either have the receipt emailed or no receipt at all, and then accept the total. You remember, you must hit close in order to completely close out the sale. So even if it's balanced due, it doesn't close automatically. Now, as it stands, we have two closed tickets and three open ones. With the three open ones, you can still click the ticket, hard, well, you hard press on it, and then hit transfer ticket. Say this person no longer wanted to be at the table, they wanted to move to the bar. That's how you transfer the ticket from within the sale to a different table. Once again, we can transfer this person, we hard press on it, and we hit transfer ticket and move them here. If we hard press on a table that's occupied with an order, we can transfer the order to a different table or transfer the order to a different tab or mark the table as inactive. When you click transfer order, you just the screen goes grayed out. You locate the ticket, and all that are closed will officially close the ticket together. Any orders that have all their tickets closed, the uh, table will become unoccupied again. So right now, we're going to go ahead and finish out our payment. And see that the table is now open again. We're going to get a couple of these house accounts up so I can show you how we pay off the house account just like you would a credit card. And on this one, we'll just delete the ticket. 
Now that sounds the various ways and reasons to split checks and split tabs and group them together and transfer them between orders. But we need to talk about finalizing towards the end of the night when you actually need to close your shift. Remember, we need to back out of the order viewing area and come here. We click at the three lines icon, we click the adjust tips. If the um, signature capture was not turned on, then I would have the ability to input the tip here. A little warning sign would show, and then I can adjust the tip. Once I hit adjust tip, I hit OK, and the tip has been adjusted. Now, if I ever try to put in a tip that's higher than the total amount, I hit done, we'll be provided with a warning. Maybe you mistyped. And it will stay as a warning until the customer or until the manager gets to review it again. Once we're done, we hit done. Now we touched on one of those ordering modes when we were talking about your signature capture. To recap, you have to come back to your home area, click on the three lines icon, settings, and you can go through your setting configuration, especially with your check close option on how you want to accept your signature. If you have customer prompt turned on, you can be uh, asked to assign a customer to the, to the system. And if you want to practice with the system, first make sure not only your labor shift started, but your financial shift is started. And then you can enter into training mode to practice. You can tell you're in training mode because there's training mode in big, bold red letters at the top of the screen. Of course, to exit, exit out of training mode, we have to hit settings and then exit training mode. Let's go ahead and end our shift and then move on to ending our labor shift. Just like we went in to the system, we have to exit out the same way. So first we hit end shift, and we close it. Then hit clock out to end our labor shift, and indicate if we would like to type in the, uh, the tip amount that we received throughout the shift. OK. And now your shift is closed. If you're ever unsure, don't forget, you can always go in, hit the three lines, and view shifts. When you view all open shifts, you get to see the ones that have already been closed. If you ever, for example, close a shift and there were tips that were not put in place and need to be readjusted again, you can click on the shift with the eye inside of the circle and reopen it to make your changes. Now, the point of this is that after you finish your shift, you can always print a closed shift report, or we can go into our back office through mystore.ncrsilver.com and review the content. This is where we get into your reporting. So with the reporting, the first tab you're going to see is your My Store tab. It takes all of your reporting and gives you bright, beautiful visuals to review at your leisure. Let me refresh the page. Looks like the system didn't sync fast enough, but just know that you'll be able to view your transactional information from the previous day and the same day from the previous week. You can also view your trend between sales, transactions, or guests. You can also check alerts, discounts and offers, as well as email campaigns. With your continuing visual reporting, you can also look at your sales dashboard, which will help you to compare your sales or transactions over today, yesterday, last seven or 30, or beyond with your calendar feature. You get a breakdown of your daily total, your hourly average, or even your 30-minute average. Whenever you click on these, you can even click on the category breakdown to view your trend of how well it's selling throughout the week specifically and the quantity of items for each. Finally, we have our customer dashboard, which allows us to use our customer information um, and view the reporting through their email marketing, your top 10 customers, as well as your conversion rate, which tells you when you have a walk-in customer versus one who provides their name versus one who provides their email address. Now, while those are all great visuals, we really need to pass along to the results side so we can check over the reporting here. So we have your reports, your POS transactions, your financial shifts, and your labor shifts, as well as credit settlement. Remember, when you had to start a shift, you started with the labor shift. 
If you ever forget to end the labor shift, you will see the word missing here. If we click on the word missing, you can adjust it accordingly to say, no, nope, this was an incorrect punch out, or they forgot to punch out, and we're going to fix it. We choose the correct date, time, roll, rate, and we can even configure the cash tips as well as put in a note stating they forgot to clock out. We'll click Save Changes, and this labor shift has now been updated and will reflect positively on the labor shift report. You can get to the labor shift report by clicking on Reports and Down, or you can get the labor shift report through here. Remember, the other side of this is our financial shift. This is when we're actually running transactions. With this shift, you can click on the shift, and hit Done. We can also double check against what cash is owed to the store by clicking the Receive Cash button and typing in the value. If you receive less than what's expected, the value will show as red. If you're right on the money, it will show as green. And if the server turns in more cash than what was expected, it will show as golden because you're now receiving more cash than you're expecting. Also, if you you can put in a negative amount. So if you had to do a payout, you'd put a negative amount in, and that would reflect positively at the bottom of the shift. For the generalized reports, the first report that you can see is your store summary. Your store summary is going to account for all transactions within the 24-hour period of the date selected. If we check for, say, the last seven days, you'll see the breakdown between your gross sales, gross refunds, discounts and promos, overrides, um, and inclusive taxes. We can take a look at your net sales with the difference between your dine-in and drive through or your different ordering modes. How much you collected in taxes, gratuities, tips, gift cards, gift card discounts, charges, charge discounts, and ticket total. You can also take a look at your breakdown of what payments were accepted, if you had any pay-ins or payouts or cash deposits, your charges, taxes collected, discounts and promotions used, voids, labor, and of course guest counts. Remember, your labor um, number is pulled for when you put in your employee information under your user roles for your base pay or the specific information under the employee role or the employee's name specifically under their setup. Your guest count is determined by how many seats are occupied. As long as a seat is occupied, it will be counted here in this reporting. Notice we can also hit the export to a particular feature, so any time or a particular format. Anytime you click this down button, you can choose the format and then hit export and keep a digital copy of on hand. Between your device, employee, and location activities, it's the same information but from different points of view. So if you have more than one device on site, you can see how well one station is doing over the other. Same thing for employee activity. So if an employee is jumping from station to station, you can see how well they're doing it all together. Notice we even emphasize voids and clears. So if you have somebody who's continually voiding or clearing, essentially deleting the order off the ticket, you can either determine if they need um, to be brought into a meeting or need special training. Finally, we also have the location. With the location activity, if you have more than one location, you can see how well one location does over the other. The rest of them are pretty self-explanatory, where we take a look at what discounts and promotions were used, what taxes were collected, your labor shift report, which tells you how many, how many hours an employee worked in their declared tips that they put in place. For the tips that are shown here, these are credit card tips only. Offline credit will show you anytime there's credit. And of course, there's also a void audit report where not only can we see the voids and clears associated with an employee, we can see what items were specifically voided um, on this system and authorized by whom. For the sales, you can take a look between a breakdown between your departments, items, modifiers, sales summary, and hourly sales. The ones that I find most particularly interesting are your item sales your sales summary, and your hourly sales. 
Within the item sales, you can get your category name, item name, variation, current price, and your net sales information. With Sales Summary, this is going to give you a comparison between your active business days. So that way when you click on this day, it goes right back to your store summary. Hourly Sales allows you to see your busiest times of day, where you can show every single day of the week, or Mondays only for the past couple of months to see how what is sincerely your busiest time of day. For your customers, you have your bulk email, customer notes, customer sales, and of course house account activity. Remember that with your customers, while you could not create the um, you could not create a house account without the customer information. The house account activity allows you to view each one individually, if there is a balance due, and whether or not you issued a statement to the customer. Your list are also self-explanatory. We'll get to see the full list of items, customers, employees, or devices registered on your system. Now if we need to get into the nitty gritty of individual transactions, we click under the POS transactions area. Whenever you click on a line, all of those transaction details will be shown below under the ticket detail option. Lines will show you what they purchased. Payments will show you how they paid. Taxes will show you what taxes were collected. And notes will tell you if you had a note on this particular ticket. At any time, if you hit preview receipt, you'll be able to see the receipt as it was given to the customer. You can also email the customer or print this receipt directly off your computer printer. Credit settlement will look eerily like your POS transaction in that you can run your credit settlement to see your batch information. A, the main three columns you'll be paying attention to are the total amount, status, or settlement timestamp. Total amount is the amount due to your bank. Status, if it says open, means it has not gone to the bank yet. If it says settled, it's already gone to the processor and they in turn will forward it onto the bank. Settlement timestamp will show you when that action occurred. If your status is open and you are not set to auto batch, you can click the green settle batch button to push through the transaction. Once it's settled, your settlement update has been completed. Now if we check on failed, we can see what errors have been occurring with the system when it comes to trying to process a credit card. These errors are not provided by us, but rather by your processor. If you ever have an issue, be sure to contact them and just repeat the information that you see on the screen. Now to wind down the session, we're going to talk about the Help tab again, because while it was great to see what it could help you with setting up, maybe you need further explanations on particular reports that you're viewing today. Remember, in your back office, you just you are going to be stationed in a particular area, then you click Help, and additional information will be brought to your attention, as well as thank you for your time and attention today.